From time to time, we all ask some deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with woe? How can we make it better? How can we give meaning and purpose to our lives? Well, as difficult as these questions are, some people are very confident uh, about the answers to these questions. For example, morality is dictated by God in holy scriptures. When everyone obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. For example, problems are the fault of evil people who must be shamed, punished, and defeated. For example, our tribe must claim its rightful greatness under the control of a strong leader who embodies its authentic virtue. In the past, we lived in a state of order and harmony until alien forces brought on decadence and degeneration. We must restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? Uh, many of us are uh, uh, quite sure about what we don't believe, but what is it that we do believe? In my new book, Enlightenment Now, I suggest that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values. Namely, the ones that were originated during the 18th century enlightenment. That we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. Now, many people embrace the ideals of the enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. As a result, they faded into the background as a kind of bland status quo or establishment. Other ideologies have passionate advocates. And I suggest that enlightenment ideals, too, need a positive defense and an explicit commitment. So what are these ideals? I suggest that there are four of them, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each. It all begins with reason, with the realization that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion. Faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, intuition, the parsing of sacred texts are all ways of being wrong. Reason, in contrast, is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, why you're right or other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you've appealed to reason. Now, humans on their own are not particularly reasonable. Cognitive scientists have shown that we are liable to generalize from anecdotes, to reason from stereotypes, that we seek evidence that confirms our beliefs while ignoring evidence that disconfirms them, and we're overconfident about our knowledge, our wisdom, and our rectitude. However, people are capable of reason if they adopt certain norms uh, among them. Free speech, open criticism and debate, logical analysis, fact-checking, and empirical testing, which brings me to the second enlightenment ideal, science. Science is based on the conviction that the world is intelligible, that we can understand it by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Science has shown itself to be our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. Uh, an important theme of the Enlightenment is that there can be a science of human nature, and that beliefs about society are testable, just like any other beliefs about the world. Science provides not just technical know-how, but fundamental insights about the human condition. Naturalism. The laws of the universe have no goal or purpose related to human welfare, with the implication that if we want to improve that welfare, we have to figure out how to do it ourselves. Entropy. In a closed system, without input of energy, disorder increases. Things fall apart, stuff happens. And that's because there are vastly more ways for things to go wrong than to go right. Evolution. Humans are products of a competitive process which selects for reproductive success, not for well-being. As Immanuel Kant put it in different terms, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing can be built. Well, this leads to the third enlightenment value, humanism, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of human beings. Well, enhancing human flourishing, who could be against that? It sounds uh, quite obvious. But it's not at all obvious, and there are distinct alternatives to humanism, such as that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe, nation, race, class, or faith, 
to obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure others to do the same, to achieve feats of heroic greatness, or to advance a mystical force, dialectic struggle, or pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. Humanism is feasible because humans are endowed with a sense of sympathy, another uh, recurring theme of the Enlightenment, that we have an ability to be concerned with the welfare of others. Unfortunately, by default, our circle of sympathy is rather small. We tend to feel the pain only of our genetic relatives, our uh, a few friends and allies, uh, and cute little furry baby animals, and that's about it. But our circle of sympathy can be expanded through forces of cosmopolitanism, education, journalism, art, mobility, and even reason. As soon as I open up a discussion with you, I can't insist that my interests are special just because I'm me and you're not and hope for you to take me seriously. The very act of engaging in a conversation presupposes that our interests are symmetrical. Uh, finally, we have progress the expectation that if we apply knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, we can gradually succeed. Well, you may ask, if human nature doesn't change, how is progress possible? And an answer from the Enlightenment is that it's possible through benign institutions, which allow us to deploy energy and knowledge to combat entropy, that magnify the better angels of our nature, like reason and sympathy, while marginalizing our inner demons, our biases, our illusions, our tribalism, and our thirst for dominance and vengeance. Examples of institutions that we owe to the Enlightenment include democracy, declarations of rights, markets, organizations for global cooperation, and institutions of truth-seeking, such as academies, scientific societies, free press, uh, free press, and organizations like uh, South By. So, 250 years later, how did that Enlightenment thing work out? <laughs> well, if you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not very well, because I have discovered that intellectuals hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. If you think we can solve problems, I have been told, that means that you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition and false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. <laughs> you are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss alluding to the Voltaire character who declared all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, as it happens, Pangloss was a pessimist. A true optimist believes this is not the best of all possible worlds. There can be much better worlds than the one we have today. But these considerations are irrelevant because the question of whether progress has occurred is not a matter of whether you have a sunny disposition or you see the glass as half full or you see the world through rose-tinted glasses, but it's an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, I submit that is progress. Well, let's take a look at the data. Beginning with life, the most precious resource. For most of human history, life expectancy at birth hovered around 30 years. But beginning with the Enlightenment, with the discovery of vaccination, sanitation, later antibiotics, and other advances in medicine and public health, life expectancy has increased so that today, uh, the average across the world is 71 years. And virtually no one guesses that it's that high. Uh, as with many examples of human progress, this the unfolding has not been even across the surface uh, of the world. That um, Europe was the first region to escape from universal early death and poverty, uh, and the, uh, later the uh, Americas. Uh, more recently in the 20th century, Asia has almost caught up, and now we are seeing sub-Saharan Africa close the gap. For most of uh, human history, the prime reason for reduced life expectancy was the death of children, the tragedy in which uh, a large number of children 
uh, did not live to see their fifth birthday. Even in a country that today we associate as the most uh, wealthy and advanced in the world, Sweden, one-third of children did not live to see their fifth birthday in 1750. That has been brought down to a third of 1%. That is a hundredfold decrease. And similar uh, progress has been enjoyed in other regions of the world. Um, here are some countries that represent their continents, Canada in North America, South Korea in Asia, Chile in Latin America. And here we have Ethiopia in Sub-Saharan Africa, which has brought its rate of child mortality down from 25% to 6%. Still way too high, but the progress is continuing. Health. The biggest killer in most of human history was infectious disease, a cause of death that is all but eliminated in the developed world. But even in the developing world, there has been fantastic progress made just in the last 20 years against the five biggest causes of the death of children in the developing world from infectious disease, uh, pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and HIV AIDS. Sustenance. It takes uh, about 2,500 calories per person to uh, feed a population, taking into account uh, age and uh, activity. Uh, beginning in England with the agricultural revolution in the late 18th century, that is um, techniques like crop rotation, more efficient planting and harvesting, later the invention of synthetic fertilizers, the mechanization of agriculture, selective breeding of vigorous hybrids, and efficient transportation networks. Uh, other regions have grown enough calories to feed their population, United States, France, and more recently, China and India have made spectacular advances in their ability to feed themselves. Here you have the graph for the world as a whole. Now, this would be a dubious form of progress if all those calories were just making fat people fatter. Uh, but in fact, they have been reducing undernourishment quite dramatically at the low end of the scale. In 19, as recently as 1970, 35% of the people in the developing world were undernourished. That has been uh, brought, brought down to less than half that level. Uh, again, the progress was highly uneven. Latin America was the first region in the developing world to uh, um, decimate undernourishment. Here you have three regions in Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa recently has been making great progress. Of course, the biggest uh, uh, hit to human well-being from uh, insufficient calories consists of famine, one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, which could devastate any continent for most of human history uh, without warning. But uh, famine deaths have been drastically reduced, and now famines occur only in the most remote and uh, war-torn regions of the world. Prosperity. For most of human history, there was virtually no uh, economic growth to speak of. This is a graph show, showing the gross world product from the year one to the year 2015. And uh, it shows that there was, uh, the line is pretty close to flat until it takes off with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, uh, thanks to advances in technology, and particularly energy capture, but an educated populace, markets and finance, and most recently, global trade which have resulted in a increase in gross world product of about 200 times since the late 18th century. Again, the great escape from universal uh, wretchedness was highly uneven, with uh, uh, England and the United States being the first to escape. But then uh, in the 20th century, South Korea, formerly a uh, dirt poor country, has become highly affluent. And here we have um, Chile, and even China and India are starting to show uh, exponential growth. In fact, the gross domestic product per person in India today is uh, equivalent to that of Sweden in around 1920. Uh, again, this would be a dubious example of progress if it simply made the 1% uh, still richer. But in fact, the growth of worldwide prosperity has been decimating extreme poverty, defined as the bare minimum necessary to feed oneself and one's family. By that criterion, about 90% of the world uh, was extremely poor 200 years ago, and that has fallen to uh, less than 10%. Uh, in fact, there's been a three quarters reduction in extreme poverty just in the last 30 years. And one of the UN's sustainable development goals is to eliminate extreme poverty everywhere on Earth by the uh, 2030s. And may we live to see that day.
So Jesus may have been wrong when he said, the poor you will always have with you. Uh, as a result of ri poor countries getting richer faster than rich countries getting richer, international inequality has uh, turned a corner and is starting to decline. It had to increase with the Industrial Revolution as some regions became rich, leaving others behind. But now that uh, trend has uh, started to uh, make a U-turn. Now, of course, within rich countries, inequality has increased. But it doesn't mean that rich countries have been uh, more heedless of the needy. Quite the contrary. Uh, until the 20th century, most rich countries spent no more than 1.5% 1 per 1 of their GDP on the uh, poor, on children, on uh, the sick, on the elderly. But starting in the 20th century, every developed country embarked on a massive program of redistribution. So today, a, the median across OECD countries is that 22% of their GDP gets redistributed in social spending. Thanks to some of this social spending, uh, poverty has decreased in the United States, even when, though inequality has increased. In, uh, if you measure poverty by disposable income, that is after taxes and transfers, uh, then in 1960, by one measure, 32% of Americans uh, were poor. That has fallen to 7%. And if you measure poverty in terms of consumption, that is what uh, people can afford to buy, then poverty has decreased from 30% to 